you really require electrical engineers who are able to understand concepts in fluid dynamics and heat transfer uh, as well as any mechanical engineer. Um, what sort of careers do you see emerging in that space? Uh, because even at the tool level, there are tools that do chip design, VLSI, and in you know, a chip level design, there are tools that help with thermal management. And I know there are companies wanting to bridge this gap, but uh, so tell us a little bit about where this idea will go. As today, it's a second resort, as you said, but I think there's a direction that's pointing to it becoming the first resort. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, ultimately you will see electronic systems that require stacks of chips. So, for example, one of our uh, recent proposals working with Purdue, actually, is to look at uh, 27 chips which are uh, mounted in stacks that are three high, so three by three by three, basically. And when you think about something like that, it is really almost... Uh, impossible to dissipate significant power in all of these chips at the same time. So you would either be forced to uh, run them at low power and not get optimal performance, or you will be forced to do cooling everywhere. So you will have to get in between the stacks or even in between the chips with the micro channels. Uh, there are tremendous opportunities in this field for uh, new graduates because there are literally problems that today seem insurmountable. It sounds really simple that, oh, we'll put microchannels, but that requires a change to the way silicon is manufactured. When I discuss this idea with someone who works in, uh, let's say, Intel or AMD, and their job is to uh, manufacture chips, they'll, uh, they'll laugh <laughs> because they know the challenges. And as a mechanical engineer, I don't understand those challenges. I just understand that I need to get fluid in there. Sure. So it will take, this is an idea that will take years to implement. One recent development has been chip-to-chip uh, -chip bonding, which is called hybrid bonding. So when the assembled chips now, there is no, the interconnection happens through copper-to-copper -copper bonding at the interface, and the silicon oxide bonds to silicon oxide at the interface. So it becomes almost like a monolithic device. So I could see with the chips like that, you can sacrifice part of the chip for cooling and then bond them completely uh, without thermal interfaces and then you can pump fluid through them. Realistically, I don't think this will happen in the next five years. I think this is a long-term solution. In the meantime, we have a lot of great careers for people working on single phase and two phase cooling to tweak every possible watt out of the chip in the, in the near future. Sure. In this, you know, let's say the first little part of this conversation, we've talked of uh, this conversation has portrayed electrical engineers as the bad guys producing the heat and the mechanical engineers as the good guys trying to remove the heat away or help them. What have electrical engineers done in all of the last several decades to really bring out, bring down heat output? <laughs> the simple answer is uh, they've pr probably done a lot that I don't know about. But from my perspective, it looks like they are solely focused on producing the most aggressive technology that they can, that can deliver the most function. So they're building chips that are super aggressive, and those chips require a lot of heat. I'll give you an example. It used to be a rack like this, for example, the size of your cabinet, would dissipate 30 kilowatts. And that, that's really the average in data centers nowadays. The system that uh, our partners in industry are working on today would be in the range of 100 kilowatts, so more than 3x the current average. The next design is in the range of 200 to 250 kilowatts. And in five years' time, we're talking about one megawatt per cabinet. So, wow. And that's why they need nuclear power plants to run the data centers. I mean, that's literally what people are thinking about doing right now. They want to build nuclear power plants to power AI. That's just unimaginable. It was unimaginable many years ago, but today people are discussing real plans. But uh, in the last several decades, 
the operating voltages of chips have come down significantly and that has reduced the, the thermal footprint in some sense. Is that a direction you see electrical engineers, you know, taking further? They can up to a point, but also at the same time, the number of transistors on a chip went from thousands to millions to billions, and now we're approaching a trillion. So the number of transistors is huge, and each time you activate a transistor, you generate heat. Plus, when you talk about uh, transistors that are, say, two nanometers, the, the separation between the electrical uh, conductors becomes so small that you really have a quantum uh, leak between those, and that's heat. So it, the problem, yeah, you can reduce the voltage, but you're reducing the gap between the lines, which means you are, uh, the risk is higher and you generate heat. So for every watt you put, maybe a quarter of it would become lost heat due to uh, leaks. So it's a, it's a challenge that exists because the price is so high. Being able to power AI is not easy, but uh, you're changing the world with AI. So people are pursuing it. So this changing the world with AI is in some sense powered by thermal engineers out there material scientists and of course of course cleverly designed electronics i mean nvidia is a classic case in in point